Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The Mysterious Key and What It Opened is a novella by Louisa May Alcott, the beloved author of Little Women. Published in 1867, this story is a departure from Alcott's more well-known domestic tales, delving into the realms of mystery and the supernatural. The story is set in an English manor house and follows the lives of two families who are connected by a dark secret. Sir Richard Trevlin dies suddenly, leaving behind a will that hands his estate to his wife, Lady Trevlin, and a young daughter named Lillian. A mysterious key is also left behind, which is said to open a locked room in the manor that holds a secret. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 1 The Prophecy Trevlin lands in Trevlin Gold, ere nor heirs air shall hold, undisturbed, till, spite of rust, truth is found in Trevlin dust. This is the third time I've found you poring over that old rhyme. What is the charm, Richard? Not its poetry, I fancy. And the young wife laid a slender hand on the yellow, time-worn page where, in old English text, appeared the line she laughed at. Richard Trevlin looked up with a smile and threw by the book, as if annoyed at being discovered reading it. Drawing his wife's hand through his own, he led her back to her couch, folded the soft shawls about her, and, sitting in a low chair beside her, said in a cheerful tone, though his eyes betrayed some hidden care, My love, that book is a history of our family for centuries, and that old prophecy has never yet been fulfilled, except the heir and heiress line. I am the last Trevlin, and as the time draws near when my child shall be born, I naturally think of his future and hope he will enjoy his heritage in peace. God grant it, softly echoed Lady Trevlin, adding, with a look askance at the old book, I read that history once and fancied it must be a romance, such dreadful things are recorded in it. Is it all true, Richard? Yes, dear. I wish it was not. Ours has been a wild, unhappy race till the last generation or two. The stormy nature came in with old Sir Ralph, the fierce Norman knight who killed his only son in a fit of wrath by a blow with his steel gauntlet because the boy's strong will would not yield to his. Yes, I remember, and his daughter Clotilde held the castle during a siege and married her cousin, Count Hugo. Tis a warlike race, and I like it in spite of the mad deeds. Married her cousin? That has been the bane of our family in times past. Being too proud to mate elsewhere, we have kept to ourselves till idiots and lunatics began to appear. My father was the first who broke the law among us, and I followed his example, choosing the freshest, sturdiest flower I could find to transplant into our exhausted soil. I hope it will do you honor by blossoming bravely. I never forget that you took me from a very humble home and have made me the happiest wife in England. And I never forget that you, a girl of 18, consented to leave your hills and come to cheer the long deserted house of an old man like me, returned her husband fondly. Nay, don't call yourself old, Richard, you are only forty-five, the boldest, handsomest man in Warwickshire. 
but lately you look worried. What is it? Tell me and let me advise or comfort you. It is nothing, Alice, except my natural anxiety for you, well, Kingston, what do you want? Trevlin's tender tones grew sharp as he addressed the entering servant and the smile on his lips vanished, leaving them dry and white as he glanced at the card he handed him. An instant he stood staring at it, then asked, is the man here? In the library, sir. I'll come. Flinging the card into the fire, he watched it turn to ashes before he spoke with averted eyes, only some annoying business, love, I shall soon be with you again. Lie and rest till I come. With a hasty caress, he left her, but as he passed a mirror, his wife saw an expression of intense excitement in his face. She said nothing and lay motionless for several minutes evidently struggling with some strong impulse. He is ill and anxious, but hides it from me. I have a right to know, and he'll forgive me when I prove that it does no harm. As she spoke to herself, she rose, glided noiselessly through the hall, entered a small closet built in the thickness of the wall, and, bending to the keyhole of a narrow door, listened with a half-smile on her lips at the trespass she was committing. A murmur of voices met her ear. Her husband spoke oftenest, and suddenly some word of his dashed the smile from her face as if with a blow. She started, shrank, and shivered, bending lower with set teeth, white cheeks, and panic-stricken heart. Paler and paler grew her lips, wilder and wilder her eyes, fainter and fainter her breath, till, with a long sigh, a vain effort to save herself, she sank prone upon the threshold of the door, as if struck down by death. Mercy on us, my lady, are you ill? cried Hester, the maid, as her mistress glided into the room looking like a ghost half an hour later. I am faint and cold. Help me to my bed, but do not disturb Sir Richard. A shiver crept over her as she spoke, and, casting a wild, woeful look about her, she laid her head upon the pillow like one who never cared to lift it up again. Hester, a sharp-eyed, middle-aged woman, watched the pale creature for a moment, then left the room muttering, something is wrong, and Sir Richard must know it. That black-bearded man came for no good, I'll warrant. At the door of the library, she paused. No sound of voices came from within, a stifled groan was all she heard, and without waiting to knock she went in, fearing she knew not what. Sir Richard sat at his writing table pen in hand, but his face was hidden on his arm, and his whole attitude betrayed the presence of some overwhelming despair. Please, sir, my lady is ill. Shall I send for anyone? No answer. Hester repeated her words, but Sir Richard never stirred. Much alarmed, the woman raised his head, saw that he was unconscious, and rang for help. But Richard Trevlin was past help, though he lingered for some hours. He spoke but once, murmuring faintly, will Alice come to say goodbye? Bring her if she can come, said the physician. Hester went, found her mistress lying as she left her, like a figure carved in stone. When she gave the message, Lady Trevlin answered sternly, tell him I will not come, and turned her face to the wall, with an expression which daunted the woman too much for another word. Hester whispered the hard answer to the physician, fearing to utter it aloud, but Sir Richard heard it and died with a despairing prayer for pardon on his lips. When day dawned, Sir Richard lay in his shroud and his little daughter in her cradle, the one unwept, the other unwelcomed by the wife and mother who, twelve hours before, had called herself the happiest woman in England. They thought her dying 
and at her own command gave her the sealed letter bearing her address which her husband left behind him. She read it, laid it in her bosom, and, waking from the trance which seemed to have so strongly chilled and changed her, besought those about her with passionate earnestness to save her life. For two days she hovered on the brink of the grave, and nothing but the indomitable will to live saved her, the doctors said. On the third day she rallied wonderfully, and some purpose seemed to gift her with unnatural strength. Evening came, and the house was very still, for all the sad bustle of preparation for Sir Richard's funeral was over, and he lay for the last night under his own roof. Hester sat in the darkened chamber of her mistress, and no sound broke the hush but the low lullaby the nurse was singing to the fatherless baby in the adjoining room. Lady Trevlin seemed to sleep, but suddenly put back the curtain, saying abruptly, where does he lie? In the state chamber, my lady, replied Hester, anxiously watching the feverish glitter of her mistress's eye, the flush on her cheek, and the unnatural calmness of her manner. Help me to go there, I must see him. It would be your death, my lady. I beseech you, don't think of it, began the woman, but Lady Trevlin seemed not to hear her and something in the stern pallor of her face awed the woman into submission. Wrapping the slight form of her mistress in a warm cloak, Hester half led, half carried her to the stateroom and left her on the threshold. I must go in alone, fear nothing, but wait for me here, she said, and closed the door behind her. Five minutes had not elapsed when she reappeared with no sign of grief on her rigid face. Take me to my bed and bring my jewel box, she said with a shuddering sigh as the faithful servant received her with an exclamation of thankfulness. When her orders had been obeyed, she drew from her bosom the portrait of Sir Richard which she always wore and, removing the ivory oval from the gold case, she locked the former in a tiny drawer of the casket, replaced the empty locket in her breast, and bade Hester give the jewels to Watson, her lawyer, who would see them put in a safe place till the child was grown. Dear heart, my lady, you'll wear them yet, for you're too young to grieve all your days, even for so good a man as my blessed master. Take comfort and cheer up for the dear child's sake if no more. I shall never wear them again was all the answer as Lady Trevlin drew the curtains as if to shut out hope. Sir Richard was buried and the nine days gossip over, the mystery of his death died for want of food for the only person who could have explained it was an estate which forbade all allusion to that tragic day. For a year, Lady Trevlin's reason was in danger. A long fever left her so weak in mind and body that there was little hope of recovery and her days were passed in a state of apathy sad to witness. She seemed to have forgotten everything, even the shock which had so sorely stricken her. The sight of her child failed to rouse her and month after month slipped by leaving no trace of their passage on her mind and but slightly renovating her feeble body. Who the stranger was, what his aim in coming, or why he never reappeared, no one discovered. The contents of the letter left by Sir Richard were unknown, for the paper had been destroyed by Lady Trevlin and no clue could be got from her. Sir Richard had died of heart disease, the physician said, though he might have lived years had no sudden shock assailed him. There were few relatives to make investigations and friends soon forgot the sad young widow, so the years rolled on and Lillian the heiress grew from infancy to childhood in the shadow of this mystery. Chapter 2 Paul Come, child, the dew is falling and it is time we went in. No. No, Mama is not rested yet, so I may run down to the spring if I like. 
and Lillian, as willful as winsome, vanished among the tall ferns where deer couched and rabbits hid. Hester leisurely followed, looking as unchanged as if a day instead of twelve years had passed since her arms received the little mistress who now ruled her like a tyrant. She had taken but a few steps when the child came flying back, exclaiming in an excited tone, Oh, come quick. There's a man there, a dead man. I saw him and I'm frightened. Nonsense, child, it's one of the keepers asleep or some stroller who has no business here. Take my hand and we'll see who it is. Somewhat reassured, Lillian led her nurse to one of the old oaks beside the path and pointed to a figure lying half hidden in the fern. A slender, swarthy boy of sixteen with curly black hair, dark brows, and thick lashes, a singularly stern mouth, and a general expression of strength and pride which added character to his boyish face and dignified his poverty. His dress betrayed that, being dusty and threadbare, his shoes much worn, and his possessions contained in the little bundle on which he pillowed his head. He was sleeping like one quite spent with weariness and never stirred, though Hester bent away the ferns and examined him closely. He's not dead, my dearie, he's asleep, poor lad, worn out with his day's tramp, I dare say. I'm glad he's alive and I wish he'd wake up. He's a pretty boy, isn't he? See what nice hands he's got and his hair is more curly than mine. Make him open his eyes, Hester commanded the little lady whose fear had given place to interest. Hush, he's stirring. I wonder how he got in and what he wants, whispered Hester. I'll ask him and before her nurse could arrest her, Lillian drew a tall fern softly over the sleeper's face laughing aloud as she did so. The boy woke at the sound and without stirring lay looking up at the lovely little face bent over him as if still in a dream. Bella Cara, he said in a musical voice. Then as the child drew back abashed at the glance of his large, bright eyes, he seemed to wake entirely and, springing to his feet, looked at Hester with a quick, searching glance. Something in his face and air caused the woman to soften her tone a little as she said gravely, Did you wish to see anyone at the hall? Yes. Is Lady Trevlin here? was the boy's answer as he stood cap in hand with the smile fading already from his face. She is, but unless your business is very urgent you had better see Parks, the keeper, we don't trouble my lady with trifles. I've a note for her from Colonel Daventry, and as it is not a trifle, I'll deliver it myself, if you please. Hester hesitated an instant, but Lillian cried out, Mama is close by, come and see her, and led the way, beckoning as she ran. The lad followed with a composed air, and Hester brought up the rear, taking notes as she went with a woman's keen eye. Lady Trevlin, a beautiful, pale woman, delicate in health and melancholy in spirit, sat on a rustic seat with a book in her hand, not reading, but musing with an absent mind. As the child approached, she held out her hand to welcome her, but neither smiled nor spoke. Mama, here is a person to see you, cried Lillian, rather at a loss how to designate the stranger whose height and gravity now awed her. A note from Colonel Daventry, my lady, and with a bow the boy delivered the missive. Scarcely glancing at him, she opened it and read, My dear friend, the bearer of this, Paul Jex, has been with me some months and has served me well. I brought him from Paris, but he is English born and though friendless, prefers to remain here even after we leave as we do in a week. 
When I last saw you, you mentioned wanting a lad to help in the garden. Paul is accustomed to that employment, but my wife used him as a sort of page in the house. Hoping you may be able to give him shelter, I venture to send him. He is honest, capable, and trustworthy in all respects. Pray try him and oblige. Yours sincerely, J. R. Daventry. The place is still vacant and I shall be very glad to give it to you if you incline to take it, said Lady Trevlin, lifting her eyes from the note and scanning the boy's face. I do, madam, he answered respectfully. The colonel says you are English, added the lady in a tone of surprise. The boy smiled, showing a faultless set of teeth as he replied, I am my lady, though just now I may not look it, being much tanned and very dusty. My father was an Englishman, but I've lived abroad a good deal since he died and got foreign ways, perhaps. As he spoke without any accent and looked full in her face with a pair of honest blue eyes under the dark lashes, Lee Trevlin's momentary doubt vanished. Your age, Paul? Sixteen, my lady. You understand gardening? Yes, my lady. And what else? I can break horses, serve a table, do errands, read aloud, ride after a young lady is groom, illuminate on parchment, train flowers, and make myself useful in any way. The tone, half modest, half eager, in which the boy spoke, as well as the odd list of his accomplishments, brought a smile to Lady Trevlin's lips, and the general air of the lad prepossessed her. I want Lillian to ride soon, and Roger is rather old for an escort to such a little horsewoman. Don't you think we might try Paul? She said, turning to Hester. The woman gravely eyed the lad from head to foot and shook her head, but an imploring little gesture and a glance of the handsome eyes softened her heart in spite of herself. Yes, my lady, if he does well about the place and Parks thinks he's steady enough, we might try it by and by. Lillian clapped her hands and, drawing nearer, exclaimed confidingly as she looked up at her new groom, I know he'll do, Mama. I like him very much, and I hope you'll let him train my pony for me. Will you, Paul? Yes. As he spoke very low and hastily, the boy looked away from the eager little face before him and a sudden flush of color crossed his dark cheek. Hester sighed and said within herself, that boy has good blood in his veins. He's no clodhopper's son, I can tell by his hands and feet, his air and walk poor lad, it's hard for him, I'll warrant, but he's not too proud for honest work and I like that. You may stay, Paul and we will try you for a month. Hester, take him to Parks and see that he is made comfortable. Tomorrow we will see what he can do. Come, darling, I am rested now. As she spoke, Lady Trevlin dismissed the boy with a gracious gesture and led her little daughter away. Paul stood watching her as if forgetful of his companion till she said, Rather tartly, young man, you'd better have thanked my lady while she was here than stare after her, now it's too late. If you want to see Parks, you'd best come, for I'm going. Is that the family tomb yonder, where you found me asleep, was the unexpected reply to her speech, as the boy quietly followed her, not at all daunted by her manner. Yes. And that reminds me to ask how you got in and why you were napping there instead of doing your errand properly. I leaped the fence and stopped to rest before presenting myself. Miss Hester was the cool answer accompanied by a short laugh as he confessed his trespass. You look as if you'd had a long walk, 
Where are you from? London. Bless the boy. It's 50 miles away. So my shoes show, but it's a pleasant trip in summertime. But why did you walk, child? Had you no money? Plenty, but not for wasting on coaches when my own stout legs could carry me. I took a two days holiday and saved my money for better things. I like that, said Hester with an approving nod. You'll get on, my lad, if that's your way, and I'll lend a hand, for laziness is my abomination and one sees plenty nowadays. Thank you. That's friendly, and I'll prove that I am grateful. Please tell me, is my lady ill? Always delicate since Sir Richard died. How long ago was that? Ten years or more. Are there no young gentlemen in the family? No, Miss Lillian is an only child and a sweet one, bless her. A proud little lady, I should say. And well she may be, for there's no better blood in England than the Trevlins and she's heiress to a noble fortune. Is that the Trevlin coat of arms? Asked the boy abruptly, pointing to a stone falcon with the motto me and mine carved over the gate through which they were passing. Yes. Why do you ask? Mere curiosity. I know something of heraldry and often paint these things for my own pleasure. One learns odd amusements abroad, he added seeing an expression of surprise on the woman's face. You'll have little time for such matters here. Come in and report yourself to the keeper, and if you'll take my advice, ask no questions of him, for you'll get no answers. I seldom ask questions of men, as they are not fond of gossip. And the boy nodded with a smile of mischievous significance as he entered the keeper's lodge. A sharp lad and a saucy, if he likes. I'll keep my eye on him, for my lady takes no more thought of such things than a child, and Lillian cares for nothing but her own will. He has a taking way with him, though, and knows how to flatter. It's well he does, poor lad, for life's a hard matter to a friendless soul like him. As she thought these thoughts, Hester went on to the house, leaving Paul to win the good graces of the keeper, which he speedily did by assuming an utterly different manner from that he had worn with the woman. That night, when the boy was alone in his own room, he wrote a long letter in Italian describing the events of the day, enclosed a sketch of the falcon and motto, directed it to Father Cosmo Carmela, Genoa and lay down to sleep, muttering, with a grim look and a heavy sigh, so far so well, I'll not let my heart be softened by pity, or my purpose changed till my promise is kept. Pretty child, I wish I had never seen her. Chapter 3 Secret Service In a week Paul was a favorite with the household, even prudent Hester felt the charm of his presence and owned that Lillian was happier for a young companion in her walks. Hitherto the child had led a solitary life with no playmates of her own age, such being the will of my lady, therefore she welcomed Paul as a new and delightful amusement, considering him her private property and soon transferring his duties from the garden to the house. Satisfied of his merits, my lady yielded to Lillian's demands and Paul was installed as page to the young lady. Always respectful and obedient, he never forgot his place, yet seemed unconsciously to influence all who approached him and win the goodwill of everyone. My lady showed unusual interest in the lad, and Lillian openly displayed her admiration for his accomplishments and her affection for her devoted young servitor. Hester was much flattered by the confidence he reposed in her, for to her alone did he tell his story, 
and of her alone asked advice and comfort in his various small straits. It was as she suspected, Paul was a gentleman's son, but misfortune had robbed him of home, friends, and parents, and thrown him upon the world to shift for himself. This sad story touched the woman's heart and the boy's manly spirit won respect. She had lost a son years ago, and her empty heart yearned over the motherless lad. Ashamed to confess the tender feeling, she wore her usual severe manner to him in public, but in private softened wonderfully and enjoyed the boy's regard heartily. Paul, come in. I want to speak with you a moment, said my lady, from the long window of the library to the boy who was training vines outside. Dropping his tools and pulling off his hat, Paul obeyed, looking a little anxious, for the month of trial expired that day. Lady Trevlin saw and answered the look with a gracious smile. Have no fears. You are to stay if you will, for Lillian is happy and I am satisfied with you. Thank you, my lady. And an odd glance of mingled pride and pain shone in the boy's downcast eyes. That is settled, then. Now let me say what I called you in for. You spoke of being able to illuminate on parchment. Can you restore this old book for me? She put into his hand the ancient volume Sir Richard had been reading the day he died. It had lain neglected in a damp nook for years till my lady discovered it, and, sad as were the associations connected with it, she desired to preserve it for the sake of the weird prophecy if nothing else. Paul examined it, and as he turned it to and fro in his hands it opened at the page oftenest read by its late master. His eye kindled as he looked, and with a quick gesture he turned as if toward the light, in truth to hide the flash of triumph that passed across his face. Carefully controlling his voice, he answered in a moment as he looked up, quite composed, Yes, my lady, I can retouch the faded colors on these margins and darken the pale ink of the old English text. I like the work and will gladly do it if you like. Do it, then, but be very careful of the book while in your hands. Provide what is needful and name your own price for the work, said his mistress. Nay, my lady, I am already paid dash. How so? she asked, surprised. Paul had spoken hastily and for an instant looked embarrassed, but answered with a sudden flush on his dark cheeks. You have been kind to me, and I am glad to show my gratitude in any way, my lady. Let that pass, my boy. Do this little service for me, and we will see about the recompense afterward. And with a smile, Lady Trevlin left him to begin his work. The moment the door closed behind her, a total change passed over Paul. He shook his clenched hand after her with a gesture of menace, then tossed up the old book and caught it with an exclamation of delight as he reopened it at the worn page and reread the inexplicable verse. Another proof, another proof. The work goes bravely on, Father Cosmo, and boy as I am, I'll keep my word in spite of everything, he muttered. What is that you'll keep, lad? said a voice behind him. I'll keep my word to my lady and do my best to restore this book, Mrs. Hester, he answered, quickly recovering himself. Ah, that's the last book poor master read. I hid it away, but my lady found it in spite of me, said Hester with a doleful sigh. Did he die suddenly, then asked the boy. Dear heart, yes, I found him dying in this room with the ink scarce dry on the letter he left for my lady. A mysterious business and a sad one. Tell me about it. 
I like sad stories, and I already feel as if I belonged to the family, a loyal retainer as in the old times. While you dust the books and I rub the mold off this old cover, tell me the tale, please, Mrs. Hester. She shook her head, but yielded to the persuasive look and tone of the boy, telling the story more fully than she intended, for she loved talking and had come to regard Paul as her own, almost. And the letter? What was in it? asked the boy, as she paused at the catastrophe. No one ever knew but my lady. She destroyed it, then? I thought so, till a long time afterward, one of the lawyers came pestering me with questions and made me ask her. She was ill at the time, but answered with a look I shall never forget, no, it's not burnt, but no one shall ever see it. I dared ask no more, but I fancy she has it safe somewhere and if it's ever needed, she'll bring it out. It was only some private matters, I fancy. And the stranger? Oh, he vanished as oddly as he came and has never been found. A strange story, lad. Keep silent and let it rest. No fear of my tattling and the boy smiled curiously to himself as he bent over the book, polishing the brass bound cover. What are you doing with that pretty white wax? asked Lillian the next day as she came upon Paul in a quiet corner of the garden and found him absorbed in some mysterious occupation. With a quick gesture he destroyed his work and, banishing a momentary expression of annoyance, he answered in his accustomed tone as he began to work anew, I am molding a little deer for you, Miss Lillian. See, here is a rabbit already done and I'll soon have a stag also. It's very pretty. How many nice things you can do and how kind you are to think of my liking something new. Was this wax what you went to get this morning when you rode away so early? asked the child. Yes, Miss Lillian. I was ordered to exercise your pony and I made him useful as well. Would you like to try this? It's very easy. Lillian was charmed and for several days wax modeling was her favorite play. Then she tired of it and Paul invented a new amusement, smiling his inexplicable smile as he threw away the broken toys of wax. You are getting pale and thin, keeping such late hours, Paul. Go to bed, boy, go to bed and get your sleep early, said Hester a week afterward with a motherly air as Paul passed her one morning. And how do you know I don't go to bed? he asked, wheeling about. My lady has been restless lately and I sit up with her till she sleeps. As I go to my room, I see your lamp burning and last night I got as far as your door, meaning to speak to you, but didn't, thinking you'd take it amiss. But really you are the worse for late hours, child. I shall soon finish restoring the book and then I'll sleep. I hope I don't disturb you. I have to grind my colors and often make more noise than I mean to. Paul fixed his eyes sharply on the woman as he spoke, but she seemed unconscious of it and turned to go on, saying indifferently, oh, that's the odd sound, is it? No, it doesn't trouble me, so grind away and make an end of it as soon as may be. An anxious fold in the boy's forehead smoothed itself away as he left her, saying to himself with a sigh of relief, a narrow escape, it's well I keep the door locked. The boy's light burned no more after that and Hester was content till a new worry came to trouble her. On her way to her room late one night, she saw a tall shadow flit down one of the side corridors that branched from the main one. For a moment she was startled, but being a woman of courage, 
She followed noiselessly till the shadows seemed to vanish in the gloom of the great hall. If the house ever owned a ghost, I'd say that's it, but it never did, so I suspect some deviltry. I'll step to Paul. He's not asleep, I dare say. He's a brave and a sensible lad, and with him I'll quietly search the house. Away she went, more nervous than she would own, and tapped at the boy's door. No one answered, and, seeing that it was ajar, Hester whisked in so hurriedly that her candle went out. With an impatient exclamation at her carelessness, she glided to the bed, drew the curtain, and put forth her hand to touch the sleeper. The bed was empty. A disagreeable thrill shot through her as she assured herself of the fact by groping along the narrow bed. Standing in the shadow of the curtain, she stared about the dusky room in which objects were visible by the light of a new moon. Lord bless me, what is the boy about? I do believe it was him I saw in the dash she got no further in her mental exclamation for the sound of light approaching footsteps neared her. Slipping around the bed she waited in the shadow and a moment after Paul appeared looking pale and ghostly with dark, disheveled hair, wide open eyes and a cloak thrown over his shoulders. Without a pause he flung it off, laid himself in bed and seemed to sleep at once. Paul, Paul, whispered Hester, shaking him after a pause of astonishment at the whole proceeding. Hey, what is it? And he sat up, looking drowsily about him. Come, come, no tricks, boy. What are you doing, trailing about the house at this hour and in such trim? Why, Hester, is it you? He exclaimed with a laugh as he shook off her grip and looked up at her in surprise. Yes, and well it is me. If it had been any of those silly girls, the house would have been roused by this time. What mischief is afoot that you leave your bed and play ghost in this wild fashion? Leave my bed? Why, my good soul, I haven't stirred, but have been dreaming with all my might these two hours. What do you mean, Hester? She told him as she relit her lamp and stood eyeing him sharply the while. When she finished, he was silent a minute, then said, looking half vexed and half ashamed, I see how it is, and I'm glad you alone have found me out. I walk in my sleep sometimes, Hester, that's the truth. I thought I got over it, but it's come back, you see, and I'm sorry for it. Don't be troubled. I never do any mischief or come to any harm. I just take a quiet promenade and march back to bed again. Did I frighten you? Just a trifle, but it's nothing. Poor lad, you'll have to have a bedfellow or be locked up. It's dangerous to go roaming about in this way, said Hester anxiously. It won't last long for I'll get more tired and then I shall sleep sounder. Don't tell anyone, please, else they'll laugh at me, and that's not pleasant. I don't mind your knowing for you seem almost like a mother, and I thank you for it with all my heart. He held out his hand with the look that was irresistible to Hester. Remembering only that he was a motherless boy, she stroked the curly hair off his forehead and kissed him with the thought of her own son warm at her heart. Good night, dear. I'll say nothing but give you something that will ensure quiet sleep hereafter. With that she left him but would have been annoyed could she have seen the convulsion of boyish merriment which took possession of him when alone for he laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks.